My special guest this week, the last time we spoke was about that fabulous film, Philomena, which apparently, when he was reading the story, originally made him cry. Now we've got his autobiography, producer, presenter, writer, mimic... And he also does sword play, I discovered. I didn't know that Steve Coogan fenced. Was that what you put on your equity card to start with? Yeah, well, you do. When, when, you, when you start out as an actor, you have no experience, so you have to pad out your CV with basically guff. And, um, <laughs> and you have to put anything down, like whatever play you might have done on an amateur level or skills. And I put down fencing, because I had grade one fencing and foil. So I could just about... I could, th- I could thrust with my foil in an impressive way but I couldn't really uh, have anything resembling a fight I remember one student we had put on her CV she put on uh, under skills she put uh, she put down puppetry brackets glove <laughs> As a, well marionettes yeah well I mean yeah but yeah. I mean glove is just about putting a sock on your hand isn't it with two, two buttons and I used to have glove puppets Yes, I'm not sure how, how much of a skill it is, though. Well, I don't know. Have you, you've seen The Muppet Show? I think they're quite clever. I saw them with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir before. They did a Christmas show with them, The Muppets and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Yeah, but, they're, but they've got sticks on their arms and stuff. There's a bit more skill involved in that. Yeah. We all like The Muppets. Have you ever worked with them? I never have. No, I mean, I did, I did Spitting Image, yes, which is I know, yeah. the closest I'll get to working well, with The Muppets. That was sort of glove puppets, but rubber. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I live in hope one day I might earn the right to work with the Muppets. I know Ricky Gervais has. So yes, I've got. I've got <laughs> so a, many he's occasions. ticked his bucket list, so I'm going to have to get it off mine. <laughs> so here we have the the autobiography, which is uh, which is out now, and it's called Easily Distracted. In which it's a weighty. T- people's autobiography is getting bigger and bigger now. So I've suddenly realised I think you have to hit a certain age before you can do an autobiography. I think I think you're right. I think you're right yeah. because I, I sometimes you see, I won't name any names, but sometimes you see lots of uh, young younger people who've uh, you can uh, name names. I'm not going to name names, but you can. Uh, no, I mean p- people who haven't been around that long who are doing these weighty tomes. I'm just thinking, well, what are they going to talk about? How? I mean, whereas I'm I'm rapidly approaching fifty. Happy birthday uh, tomorrow! Thank you very much. Uh, a few hours left of being in my forties, which I intend to <laughs> ring out for all the worth. Um, but um, yeah, I think. Uh, I, I, I've been asked before to do and I thought well I don't have much to talk about and I thought well if I, if I don't have anything to talk about at 50 then I, I, I'm not going to do one at all so I think you I think that you do need to be have been around a little bit before yes. you write about your life definitely and then you suddenly realise when you start putting it down and putting it in chronological order and you remember different things you suddenly think God I have crammed a lot in I know you've had periods of your life where you've sort of thought I don't know I mean Hollywood wasn't wasn't you you've said your best experience and different things like that and i think now you get that's why when you said i don't want to name people i know that you, you're you're a little bit funny about celebrity and people who become celebrities for, for really no particular reason i don't mind it it's just that it's not for it's, it doesn't appeal to me then i mean <clears throat> one of the byproducts of what i do is that i'm 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 famous uh because i because of what i do <clears throat> but it's yeah. not but but being famous is never was never the objective of me i love writing i love uh, entertaining and I like uh, acting and all that creative stuff um, but of course there are lots of people out there who, who are being f- who want to be famous for fame fame's sake and I'm, I wouldn't judge those people because sometimes it's all the only thing they've got and they need to pay the rent and they've got to yeah. milk it for all it's worth but it's just that's not my bag you know? it's interesting they, they were talking about this the other day with Goldie Horn on the television and they were talking about Kim Kardashian who's made zillions of pounds mm. zillions purely through starting with a with a pornographic film. And you start mm. thinking, and, and then the other day we had Justin Bieber naked, and his mm. agent's going, if anybody prints these pictures, you're in big trouble. You think, well, if you're famous, you cannot walk outside of a hotel room, start naked, mm. and not expect paparazzi to take pictures your fame comes with your job you don't necessarily want to be famous but you you are known to us yeah i mean i i do find it slightly uh, depressing this obsession with uh, celebrity for its own sake um i, I mean, especially with social media everyone th- is, thinks uh, everyone wants to be a star in their own movie in their head you know with instagram and the like mm. people just want to sort of put this narrative out there uh, where people think they only exist if they can see themselves on camera um, which is a really strange, strange condition, but it seems to afflict more and more people. Yeah. 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 But, but if you ask kids nowadays, what, what do you want to be? They'll go, famous. Why do you want to be famous? Because you'll be in the papers, because you'll be in OK magazine. As opposed to, I always say to them, why don't you just, listen, It's fame's very fickle. I've seen people in your business, you know, one minute up, the next minute. I've talked to leading actors who go, I haven't worked in a year. There's mm. nothing out there. 
No, well, that, I mean that's part of the problem with if you if you if you're an actor, however successful you are, um, you, you sometimes you you're always waiting for the next job. Um, I the reason I got I mean I got involved in writing and producing. It wasn't like I had a, I had a burning desire to write. Um, it was just a case of well, I'm gonna have to make work for myself. Um, and and it, like I said, I mean acting as a professional, unless you're right at the top, and uh, you're hugely successful and you're. Uh, movie star it, it's very precarious and it doesn't matter how successful you are so uh, any and most actors if they're smart have another string to their bow yes well you, you have quite a number of other strings I was interested looking at your at your early family life your parents moved into a house 62 65 you came along they're still in the same house yeah they are when I go home and stay with my mum and dad I sleep in the same room I was born in which is uh, isn't that unusual in this day and age? <laughs> it is very unusual. It's quite, um, it, but it's in one way it's quite reassuring. It's like because you know not much has changed in the house. So the same house I, I walked around as a toddler is the same house I, I go back to now. So it's it's actually quite grounding uh, in a strange sort of way and comforting because yeah. because the same thing you know the same drawers have the, my school reports in that have been in that same drawer for forty years. So uh, it, it's quite it's quite a nice place to go back to. Hmm. Uh, you were the fourth of six, but I mean, among the people that you knew, that wasn't a particularly big family. You knew somebody with thirteen kids. Yeah, well, there was. I mean, these were sort of the Irish Catholic immigrants. Um, were um, procreation was well. We used to say that, the, the, that it was in the days when the telly didn't work. You know, <laughs> so there used to be more, ba more babies being made. <clears throat> um, we did have a TV. It was funny enough. We were there was a slight kind of inverted snobbery because it was always the people like my grandmother who lived on the council estate that got the colour TVs first from radio rentals and the video recorders first. And we thought we were above that. So we had an Encyclopedia Britannica, which my dad <laughs> thought made us uh, elevated us. But we had a black and white TV. Um, so if I wanted to go and watch. Uh, watch a James Bond film, film in colour I had to go to my grandmother's <laughs> but we all have our cross to bear but you had a <clears> telephone <throat> I mean that was quite a rarity in a house of those days uh, well no not it wasn't that rare in, in the 70s and um, it, people it was happening more and more you know um, in fact one of my friends didn't have a phone and I used to sort of ferry messages back and forth to my mother's friend uh, like the like the messenger boy in the go-between uh, um, you know I'd run around to her friend's house with a note, she'd scribble a reply down, and I'd run back and forth, so <laughs> kept me fit. Um, but it, it, it's uh, it, it's funny how or, it, we sort of I've lived through that period of this, and we both have that period of where new media and new communications make things so instant and accessible. And I grew up in an era where TV shows uh, there was three channels, and there was the telephone at home and if you wanted to meet someone you had to make an appointment and be there and if you wanted to see a TV show you had to be in front of the TV at a certain time otherwise you'd miss it and you were never going to see it again for two years <laughs> so it was um, so it, people, it, there was more appreciation of it and and um, there was not instant access to things but um, it, and it somehow made it more special I mean, if you watch a TV show, back in the days when I grew up in the 1970s, a Christmas episode of uh, Morkham and Wise or The Good Life uh, we'll get close to 30 million yes, people. 30, yes. that's half the country yes. watching a show. So the country felt kind of smaller because you felt like you were sitting in front of uh, a programme, watching a programme. You knew that, you know, half the country was doing exactly the same thing and it made it made it for the country feel more intimate somehow. Yes, you're right. They, they were huge. I mean, now, when you, uh, I think people consider sort of eight to nine million a really good audience to get 13 million for Bake Off and they go apoplectic. That's right, absolutely, yeah. And you yeah. think, but that, you know, we, we had bigger audiences before because there was no, there was no choice. There was no choice, that's you right. You had to sit down on Christmas afternoon, you'd watch the Queen's speech mm. and then there might be the Morecambe and Wise show. That's right, and they, in fact the National Grid used to have power surges, right, which yes. they don't have anymore because if there was a, a as soon as Morecambe and Wise ended, half the country went and put the kettle on that's and there right, would be yes, a power surge. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Found difficult to cope with um so it shows you how how things have changed i think it's great in our lifetime that there has been so much technology that improves everything although i'm assuming when you when you did this book did you sit down with somebody i did i sat down with a woman called amy Raphael, right. who's, who's a very good friend of mine and a and a journalist and she sort of we talked through things and collated uh, information uh, and and recorded stuff, and then she, uh, and then we we talked about how to order it and how to structure it, and then I, I reworded it uh, in my own words. Right. Yes. Um, but the kind of the the bulk bulk work um, was done by Amy. So yeah. uh, because there's a lot of a lot of stuff 
t- that I could talk about. And uh, she sort of told me what... I mean, I, I think it's all interesting. She told me what she thought was slightly boring <laughs> and um, and what stuff that I thought was... not really volume two, is there? No, so I thought there was uh, stuff I thought was boring she thought was interesting. So, <laughs> so uh, you have a discussion about that and then decide what to keep in and then yeah. and I just elaborate on it and just uh, word it myself. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very interesting because just going back to your childhood, your, your parents uh, being Catholics, off you went to church. The only one praying, ladies and gentlemen, for an Aston Martin. Most other people were praying for other people's <laughs> health and wealth and things like that. But no, Coogan decided to go for the Aston Martin. At 11. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, it's just something I remember doing, uh, thinking that... Um, Very naughty. I, I knew that, I, you know, I wanted to be good and everything and there to be world peace and people to love each other. But I just thought, you know, is, is it OK if I also have a, 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 an expensive sports car as well? Could that be arranged? Mm. Um well, and in fact, I did. I did actually get one. The good Lord my, my mother, my mother. I'm now an atheist, but my mother says, cites it as proof that God exists because he, because she said he granted you your, your prayers. But I thought, well, he can't be a very benevolent God if he causes tsunamis on the other side of the world, but decides to give me an Aston Martin. So Gave you two, didn't he? He did, but I sold one. I thought, I thought two, two was ostentatious. I want to know how this prayer operates. We'll find out more from Steve Coogan, Easily Distracted, published now by Century. More from him after this. Special guest in conversation, he's easily distracted. Now you've discovered there was more to his book that sort of, well, that, that's, that's not interesting enough, that's boring. This is, in, this is what people want to know about. They want to know about your childhood. They want to know about the fact that your, your family fostered. So you had so apart from all, all the other siblings, you've got all these other strange people coming in. Well, there was always a, an extra couple of kids in the house. They're normally what they call wards of court um, when they, when they're sort of taken to care, and and my parents would look after them for a few months until they found a permanent home. So the kids were coming and going all the time. Um, I remember social workers coming around talking to me when I was a kid and th- thinking, why are they talking to me? Because they had to check out that it's a safe environment and all the rest of it, and. Um, there was an. I remember there was a, a car accident outside the house uh, one time, and the police came, which we, we witnessed. And the police came in to take a statement. And when they came into the house, they, the the copper said, "Is this a community centre?" <laughs> because there were so many kids running around, and we even had a pinball machine in the corner of the dining room, so it must have looked a bit like that. <laughs> Slightly strange. So, so you become an altar boy at the age of eleven, which kind of gives you another sort of thing. Do. And, you, and you keep doing that till you're till you're 16. <clears throat> but in the meanwhile, you are being, you know, that little kid who does the impressions. You've done the faulty towers. You've done all the things at home, and they all say the same to you. You should be on the telly. But of course, that eluded you in the early days because you've got to get into some sort of college. So you auditioned for quite a lot of places, but you ended up was it Manchester Poly? Yes, I went to the, there's a drama school in Manchester was now called Manchester Met that uh, the likes of Julie Walters and Bernard Hill. And, uh, went to and uh, uh, it was um, it was a great place to go to. But I, I tried to get into all the London ones, all the the Radas and Lambdas and and whatever Douglas is. But uh, <laughs> I, it, <clears throat> there seemed to be uh, the actors in those days seemed to be cut from a certain kind of cloth. They wore long overcoats, had Byronic hairstyles, and uh, uh, very well modulated voices, and were incredibly confident. <laughs> um, and uh, I couldn't quite do that. You know. I couldn't do impersonations <laughs> of them. You could do impersonations <clears throat> of them. Um, yeah, but they all had their names like uh, G- Giles and uh, Jasper and things like that. And <laughs> I didn't know people like that. So, I, I, but I'm, you know, I'm, in a way, it's, a, it's all you look back and you see how fortuitous you are because of all these decisions that made or things that seemed like a, a, a setback at the time that actually uh, help form who, the character you, you go on to be. So I'm, I'm quite grateful for a lot of the things that I thought were. Um, pitfalls and setbacks mm. back in the day. I mean, so far it's it's all going really well, but you don't seem to quite have a focus. You're doing your impressions, you're doing everything else, but you but you have to move on. You've got to try and get stuff. You bump into all sorts of people. You share a flat with Frank Skinner. Uh, you go up to Edinburgh to try and do something. Frank Frank was a little bit better known than you, and so he actually did better than you. Well, you he did w- a double show. We did you? a double act together in 1990 and actually I was slightly worse, better known than Frank, but Frank overtook me by virtue of the fact that he worked incredibly hard yes. and was always jotting down notes and improvising with the audience and and he he was superb and, and the reviews reflected that and it was kind of like a kick in the pants for me because it meant, made me you know sort my sort of self out and, and make sure I had something decent to do and at the time I was just doing impersonations and I wanted to do something more sub- substantial so I started to do comic characters uh, as a way of 
breaking out of this uh, what happens in this this business is you know you can get used up and spat out very quickly and that happened to me early on I was on Sunday night at the Palladium with Jimmy Tarbuck I was 22 years old I I did you know they they I did all these impersonations and and then a year later they were like well we've seen what you do we're on to the next thing. so I had to and it's quite it's worse than not being known at all so you're constantly having to find ways of, of reinventing yourself uh, which 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 happened because I, I managed to escape that and then become doing ca- character comedy and then of course I came up with Alan Partridge and then that presented a problem because then it was well what do I do now and uh, yes and so that that then became the sort of next quest to try and find some sort of uh, focus because as a child all I wanted to do was emulate the things I loved on TV like uh, uh, John Cleese and, and Basil Forty and, and try and do a comedy or a character that was as well loved as that and I you know arguably did that with Alan Partridge so it, I then it was then you know what what's the next step and I didn't know for a while and then I started to, and I was sort of saved if you like by an old Irish lady from St Albans called Philomena Philomena was I, but I think you were huge before that because I, I can remember thinking seeing you and, li- and listening to your voices on spitting <clears throat> image and thinking this is somebody to look out for television was very unforgiving it used up material like there was no tomorrow alan partridge as a character was was an absolute gift but he started as a sports reporter you see i thought until i until i knew better i thought he was based on alan freeman you see the dj i just thought it, it, it was that character but he sort of evolved from from the sports reporter into the presenter yeah, well, I mean, the, um, Alan's sort of an amalgam of various yeah. different people. I mean, I, I sort of, I, I would like a sort of uh, a bucket where I'd, I'd throw in any bits and bobs of anyone who sounded appropriate. Or so there's kind of, he is like a sort of Frankenstein monster of bit body parts of of other uh, of TV presenters and DJs all sort of mixed together. Um, but it, 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 the character uh, has evolved. I mean, I think. Alan Freeman. I probably borrowed Alan Freeman's hair early on, um, <laughs> quite literally. I can only right? say that because Alan Freeman <laughs> didn't have his own hair. Exactly, that's what, that's what I'm saying. It's, a bit like it, Frankie Howard. Exactly, yeah. I know a story of Frankie Howard. My friend, uh, my aunt, who's a makeup artist, once told me that Frankie Howard uh, came in to do a sketch and she had to put a wig on him and he refused to acknowledge that he had a wig on his own head so she had to put a wig on top of his other wig. <laughs> Do you know that all the all the stuff was sold after he actually died and his partner died? Everything was sold. Everything was got rid of. Right. And no, no museum took anything. I was really, really that, surprised. I that, thought. Well, I know it, it's it's strange because of course the, it's funny to do. I think there's something about comedy that people think is some is ephemeral and disposable, and we don't often appreciate it till years later. We realise that that actually culturally a lot of these comics from the past were quite important and uh, people do sort of like dismiss them a little bit and uh, I remember Terry Jones told me a story about when the BBC were going to wipe the tapes of Monty Python they were going to wipe the tapes and use the tapes to record in those days videotape was very expensive Mm. and they were going to wipe the Monty Python series and Terry Jones took the tapes from the BBC smuggled them out and kept them in his loft until years later the BBC rang up and said oh um we, we actually people want us to broadcast Monty Python again. Have you got those tapes? Can we borrow them? So it it, it shows you uh, sometimes how how uh, how little regard in in the sort mm. of pantheon of pop culture that there is for these comics. That, which is reflected in your story about... Well, but Bob Monkhouse used to have a recorder, which was unheard of in those days, and he would record all these shows, and he had all these comedy shows that he'd done, his his notebooks, he wrote everything down. I mean, he was a phenomenal collector of things. He Absolutely, Bob Monkhouse was. I had the privilege of meeting him 20 years ago, and he was, he was uh, tremendous and really appreciative of other comics and was able to actually quote some of my material back to me that from I'd done 10 years previously in real detail he had a photographic memory and like you say he really collated uh, lots of information and and st- I, i'm sure i don't know where that is at the moment i'm sure it's in some museum somewhere yeah, I hope but, so. um, but he was very fastidious uh in in recording things quite obsessive in a way yes. but uh, that's such a rather that's that's uh, quite a good legacy because now we've got records of these comics and and the their um uh, their provenance that we wouldn't have otherwise had. He was also terribly generous. You'd do an interview with him and he'd go, gosh, Steve, you've done your research. And you used to think, mm-hmm. A, that's actually quite a rarity in this day and age because people pass through in such volumes. But he was he was genuinely 
nice he worked hard and yet he was in favor out of favor Ooh, that's right he was troubles. i mean and i was never i always found him like uh, at the time when i was growing up as a sort of this slightly cheesy slight used car salesmanish sort of vibe that you used to get from him on his itv shows like the golden shot and celebrity squares but his effusiveness and enthusiasm was entirely authentic and uh when i met him uh, it, it, i just thought i, I actually you know, the, I thought I could do with a bit of that, which is um, he was very at ease with his uh, success and and loved um, loved comedy, loved being part of it. And uh, most comics, including myself, um, always have a little bit of there's something slight, there's, there's slightly distorted about them. There's something slightly screwed up, but deep seated in their psyche that helps them be funny. You know, yes, way. yes. Um, but uh, so there's always a malcontentedness uh, about them. But he had a kind of uh, a, a real uh, effusive zest for, for life and for the business he was in. Well, it was only, only a couple of days ago, I think, at the Palladium, Tarby and uh, Des O'Connor got back together again. And really? uh, yeah. combined age, I can't imagine what it is now. It's <laughs> certainly quite great. They must yeah. have played it many, many times. Philomena, would you say, was a, was a, a good turning point for you? Yeah, it was, because um, I, I it was prior to that, I'd been listening to lots of advice from people who are well-meaning, saying, well, if you what you need to do now is do a film with this uh, comic actor or that comic actor, and that will move things on. And, and it's sort of very linear, sort of uh, I, I, straight-jacketed way of thinking. And I, I became frustrated with it because I felt it felt slightly uh, fraudulent. And um, I found a story in the paper about Philomena and um, decided to pursue this as an experiment just do something purely that I wanted to do not because someone was telling me to do it mm. in the hope and, and to see what would happen to see if it would work and the best I hoped would be that it might be an interesting uh, independent film that some people would talk about and say it was a little different but um, I never thought we would get to the Oscars yeah. uh, so that was uh, still uh, I mean, the, the, it was everything I hoped would happen and more. Yes. And um, it meant that I've got a, a, a slightly different life now where I'm writing uh, and producing films about things that I care about and, and not just, you know, I'm not just chasing, you know, chasing the money. Is, is it still a dream? Is the business still a dream for you? It's, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm, I'm finally doing exactly what I want to do. I love comedy and I, can't, I won't abandon it completely, but I don't just want to be. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know comedy has a high turnover. You need new people to come through all the time to refresh it. So um, I try not to outstay my welcome. Jimmy Tarbuck said to me uh, 25 more years ago, said, "Or oh, you know, get, get on stage, hit them, then get off. You get no prizes for hanging around." It's true. So Fascinating book. You've been very honest in it, very honest, which, is, which I, I find quite refreshing. It's not it's not too sanitised. No, well, I wanted to, I didn't want to do that thing that just do some sort of uh, um, sterile PR exercise where, you know, mm. everything reflects well on me. Um, I mean, I don't... There's been the ups and downs. Let, let's, let's be honest, I don't crucify myself in it, but I do actually... <laughs> uh, um, but I did want to uh, be honest about things and um, without being... without also sort of bearing... You know, beating my chest and 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 doing some sort of uh, cathartic mea culpa about you know my life. Um, so I, I I feel I've I got the balance right. And and uh, I, what I found is that if you're honest about things, people people respond well. And if you show vulnerability and um, and and you, you try to be authentic, mm. um, people can tell. And whether that's in acting or just in everyday life or or, or in, in the way you account for yourself. So um, you know. Honesty is the best policy, I think. Not done badly for a northern lower middle class <laughs> boy, have you at all? <laughs> Easily distracted by Steve Coogan is uh, published now by Century. Thank you very much. Cheers. And those enormous countries. I think it's quite hard, even if you look at... I'm obsessed with atlases and maps anyway. So I had studied it pretty hard. And also I'd lived as a child in Hong Kong. So I had ah. a little bit of an idea. But you, you can't really get the scale of travelling across...